smaller males have to make do with some gang spawning around the edges. Where do super males come from? If one of them dies or leaves his lair, one of the largest remaining individuals make his place. Even if the even if it's like
chromosome. These sex chromosomes are different from the other chromosomes in the body. Um, the other chromosomes are matched, but for some evolutionary reason that scientists are still theorizing about, um, we get either XX or XY. Uh, and, and by the way, it doesn't rest with your father, whether you're male or female, because your mother has XX. So all she can give you is one X chromosome regardless. But your father will give you one X or one Y. Uh, most of the time. Oh, oh good. We are in order. You might be able to see better. OK. So I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But the next thing that happens after conception, at about three months in the world, um, you get a flood of, of uh, hormones, especially if you're male. This doesn't seem to happen quite so much if you're female. If you're male, uh, or at least your body thinks you're male, um, you get a flood of testosterone and other hormones that are known as androgens. Testosterone is an androgen. Uh, 
negative responses from friends and family. Um, we don't know, uh, it seems, socially how to deal with somebody who doesn't fall neatly into our categories of male and female. The fact is, this is an intersex person. This is somebody who doesn't neatly fit. All right? Another interesting thing that, um, that happens is um, it, it has a long technical name, 5-alpha reductase deficiency syndrome, um, which is a long way of saying this is a person who's born looking female um, because their body lacks a certain enzyme. Doesn't, doesn't register testosterone, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, genitalia looks female and the individual grows up female, then gets puberty, and then develops fully into a male. This individual appears to go from being a girl to being a man. And it can happen like they tell me the most dramatic changes happen in a matter of months. Okay? Now you think your home life was messed up. <laughs> it's called 5-alpha reductase deficiency syndrome. And if you want the reference, I'll give them to you later. Um, but, uh, it's only been documented in third world countries. Um, but there are a few members of a society uh, here in the United States called the Intersex Society. And it appears that that might be their story. Um, we don't like to talk about it, we, except, you know, we, it seems like we can talk about it if it happens to those people over there. And uh, we don't, it, it, it's like a threat, we don't want to have it in our homes, but it happens, okay? Um, and uh, it, I, I was talking about earlier, if, if there's a one point that I want to make this evening, it comes down to two words, nature's messy, all right? Nature doesn't like categories, doesn't do things in discrete, easily defined ways, because if either a species or life in general is going to survive, you have to have variation. All right. Um, yeah. Is there any way to know that a person or a girl has? Uh, it, it, yeah, it, there's actually ways to identify.
genes, the gay genes, and so forth. There's the Bay study of the brain, um, the hypothalamus, and smaller in gay men than it is in heterosexual men, and so on. Um, and the, the theory here behind sexual orientation is very, very tied to gender. The predominant idea is that you have a basic blueprint, female, a basic blueprint, male. And if you're gay, it's because you have a female brain and a male body. And, uh, or you're, if you're a lesbian, then you have a male typical brain and a female body. Um, I caution you uh, to look on such theories uh, and remember what I just told you, that nature's messy. Nature doesn't work in categories of male and female. Everything with nature is a continuum, a spectrum. And if we are going to survive as a species, we have to have variation. If we are going to survive as individuals in society, we have to be able to adapt. And we have to recognize that not everybody falls neatly into categories that make us comfortable. And uh, Jim's giving me the science, so I better quit here. But uh, later on, there will be a chance for questions that help to elaborate. Yeah. 
notice something about Christ. He has no beard. This is an early Christ. The first images of Christ had no beard. And that has a significance of a gender marker. What gender is God? So the next slide. Uh, this is the social, a social scientist over a century ago paved the way by looking at the construction of religion and how we live our daily lives. And I want to share this quote with you. Divine structures reflect and reinforce social structures using belief, rituals, and symbols to mask, legitimate, and sanctify power. Gender and power are complicated issues. We're going to keep very simple. This is Gender 101. I'm going to whip through this material. There's a lot I could say. The difficulty has been well, not to say. And so if I get wordy, start waving your hands and I'll go to the next idea. Go to the next slide, please. We're going to start with ancient Egypt. For a couple reasons, I've chosen three cultures. Uh, Egypt, which I've been working with, Greece and Rome, they reflect the cultural background of what we call Western civilization. Egypt is the perfect place to start because everything is different. Gender constructions are very, very different. A uh, prehistorian, a lot of this said, a long time ago when he said, the, the country is totally backward. The river runs the wrong way. The women stand up to urinate and the men squat down. This is the god Atum. Atum means everything. He is called in the literature, the very literature, uh, hermaphroditic, not hermaphroditic, bisexual or bigender. His, his title literally means everything, the all. And he represents both male and female. In the Egyptian belief, Atum masturbates the world into existence. The first beings that come out of himself have sex, male and female. The next generation, if you have the next slide, are gods that we know. Osiris, seen here with a gender marker, a beard, implements of authority. The next slide. Isis, seen here with elements of authority. We won't go into these. And of course, a divine son. So I have next slide. The divine son should lower it just a little bit. Okay, we see Horus, seen here as a hawk headed god, emphasizing his role of virility, of aggression, of the, of the revenging son. Notice he's beardless. Horus is usually beardless. He's the son of a divine father. Next slide, please. The earthly manifestation of Horus, of the avenging figure, is of course Pharaoh. The word Pharaoh means uh, Aha, great house. The Pharaoh is literally the father of his country. And we see Pharaoh protected by the idea of Horus, and of course, once again, a gender marker of a, a, a beard. Next slide. And in Egypt, everything, as I said, is different. The sky deities are female, the earth deities are male. This is, this is inverted from the European tradition. The goddess Nuke is shown here in gender markers, once again, very simply, breasts. Next slide. Uh, Egyptian gods and goddesses are very simple at times, and once you learn the basic form of Egyptian art, you learn to read it. This is something particular to Egyptology. From the outside, it, looks, it seems obtuse and esoteric, but it's really just like reading another language. The lion god is Sotmet. Sotmet is uh, a female uh, deity in a spectrum of femininity. On the one hand, there's a house, the house cat god is Bastet, who represents the domestic female. On the other hand, the terrible lion god is Sotmet. Uh, female deities in Egypt tend to be protective. Male deities tend to be creative. That's reversed from it is in the Western system. Can we have the next slide, please? In the Egyptian system, when female deities slip into a creative mode, they simply are shown with an element of creation. Here we have the phallus, uh, which is applied to Sokhmet. Uh, Sokhmet is one of the very few categories of Egyptian goddesses who actually can use set thousands. Can we get the next slide? Interestingly enough, especially for Americans, and especially for Western Europeans, when we have a tradition that women are unstable and shouldn't have political rights, 
The belief in uh, Egypt was the highest order. The most important deity is personified as a female. And this is the deity Maat. And we see here in the offering scene, the king is offering Maat. You see the little, the little offering in his left hand to the god of wisdom, Thoth. Next slide, please. Ma is personified as a female, a young female. She means wisdom, prudence, uh, measure, order, and so forth. The next slide, please. She is the personification of Pharaoh. She's the personification of the well-run state. And as a concept, this creeps into European thought, as we'll see in just a few moments. The next slide, please. Egyptian deities, as I said, seem odd to us, but you must remember certain things. We don't have the name of any Egyptian gods, we have their nicknames. The Egyptian gods were too sacred to write down. And secondly, the visual clues, the markers of gender, sex, and so forth, give us an idea about what their essential nature is. On the left, the goddess Bauset, on in the center, a ram-head god of virility, and of male force, and on the right, the goddess Neat, a goddess of war. Go to the next slide, please. When we look at the situation in Greece, it's a very different situation. Greece, first of all, is far less homogeneous than Egypt. Uh, when we talk about Greece, it's really a political term. It's best to talk about the Hellenes, and the Greeks were always squabbling with each other. They were separated by mountains, ravines, rivers, and so forth. And this, this, um, this map shows the different dialects of Greece. And they spoke different languages. Their constructions of gender are very different. Uh, some Greek women enjoyed tremendous power, tremendous rights. Most Greek women did not. Who's the next? Uh, the consummate Greek god is, of course, Zeus. A sky god, Greece was patriarchal, patrilineal, um, Egypt was matrilineal, Pharaoh received his ability to rule by proper marriage, although it, uh, he, he actually ruled patrilineal as well. So we see the gender marker, an athletic body, a middle-aged man, and a man of mature years, uh, a beard, a dynamic gesture, he's in hot pursuit on this face. Next, uh, next slide, please. Once again, uh, Zeus for Poseidon, the gender marker here is nudity. There's a difference between nakedness and nudity in our history. We won't go into that. But if you've ever gone to Chelsea, you can see what the gender marker is. The gender marker is the male body. Uh, we're going through an interesting sociological issue with the gay community and bodybuilding and so forth. We won't go into that. But what I want to mark is that the prominent gender marker here is Beard and body and once again gesture. Next slide, please. When we talk about female deities in, in um, Greece, um, in some ways it's quite different than Egypt, in other ways it's not different. We probably all recognize this as Athena. This is a wonderful little relief that was here in New York just a few years ago. It's called the Con Contemplative Athena. Um, we see her dressed in armor. She's wearing a pembos, a type of frock that young girls wore. She was a maiden, unmarried. She didn't, she didn't need a man. She's not required that for completion. Uh, she, however, comes out of the thoughts of God, of Zeus. The story is that Zeus had an affair with her mother. Curiously enough, her mother's name is Prudence, or Nature. Once again, you have the idea of dominant male and ma in order producing the daughter. Next slide, please. The role of Athena is cannot be overstated in Greek society. We see here from a wonderful piece, also this was in New York a few years ago, she's wearing a pet box once again. She's aiding both heroes and other dogs. Heracles is on the far right. In the center is, uh, is Atlas, the mountain named after him, with one Slightly, slight gesture, gesture, she holds up the heavens as she's changing the golden apple story. Can we have the next slide, please? And we see from her face that she's conceived as a rather androgynous figure. Now, I could bring in, if this were our history, and I had an hour with all this sleep, but I could bring in one more slide to show you the type of 
faces and so forth, this style of architect, uh, this style of sculpture, that this is an androgynous uh, face, an incredibly strong and very handsome face. We'll go to the next slide, please. This is Athena in her war mode, taken from the Acropolis. I might mention that the Acropolis was, was probably the only um, building built with war proceeds that had lasted through history. Next slide, please. And of course, other deities of the, of the Pantheon is Aphrodite or Venus to the Romans. Plato tells us that there are two Aphrodites. There's a heavenly Aphrodite and an earthly Aphrodite. And the, this is more than likely the earthly Aphrodite represents another aspect of gender. Once again, we see her body. An art historian would say this is no longer a new goddess. This is a naked woman. This is, a, this is an art historian. Uh, change from the nudity of gender into the sensuality of sexuality. We have the next slide. Uh, all these goddesses came from a substrata of earth goddesses, which is very popular, popular books and so forth. This is a wonderful lecture in itself. We don't have time for it, but I want you to see upraised arms and notice also what's in her what's in her headdress. Does anyone recognize what's in her headdress? Poppy seeds. She's, she, is the, she is the goddess of the two realms, of the sleeping and of the wake, and of the uh, of consciousness, of the living and of the dead. We have the next slide, please. Uh, this gives rise to an uh, idea of the enthroned goddess, uh, a motif that women should be portrayed as, in a particular uh, state and, and status. Here we have uh, the enthroned goddess. Heavily guards. This goes all through uh, Greek art. Next slide, please. And into Roman art. Next slide. The Greeks themselves realized that their gods, their quintessential male-oriented gods, came out from an earlier substrata. This is an early uh, pot uh, that depicts the birth of Apollo. Please note the position of the arms of the goddess giving birth to Apollo. We have the next slide, please. Apollo represents another aspect of gender in Greek art and, and images. We see, once again, the beardless male, note the careful detail of hair, note the, the forceful stance. And also, uh, Apollo is a male personification of order. He is, in this piece of sculpture, literally keeping chaos at arm's length. Uh, but we have, he's also, I might mention, Dressed once again in heroic nudity. His body is body armor. It's protected, it defines him, and it, uh, and it, sets, it sets the tone on a very visual basis. We have the next slide, please. Uh, Apollo has a female devil, of course, Artemis Diana. And here they're seen uh, doing uh, God's work. Uh, this refers to another myth, but I'll go into it. But Diana is once again a complex goddess, a goddess who does not have relations with men. She's a chaste goddess. Next slide, please. But she has a masculine aspect. This is Diana of Ephesus, reflecting yet another earlier strata of Greek religion. Uh, if you get into Greek religion, in ancient religion, after a while, you go into, you understand the psychological and analytical literature much, much clearer because these things, a myth as an ancient one said, the voluntary things that never were but always are. The, the protuberances in her midsections are ultimately considered breasts or more interestingly considered bull's testicles. Next slide, please. Apollo 2 has many aspects. Remember the pet box, the girl's frock? And in this beautiful example, Apollo is literally dressed in drag. What this means? We don't know. But he's wearing a pet loss. He has a brother Robert here who he requires a libation, probably to himself, and his sacred bird is seen in there. And he's, of course, a god of music uh, as well. Next slide, please. Among the uh, other members of the Pantheon is, of course, and Heracles, once again, the gender reference is obvious in his father. 
going to be fascinating to the Romans in particular. And we have here two male gods, Hercules on the left, Dionysius on the right. These are part of the decorating scheme from the Flavian first century AD uh, palace in Rome. And you see the, the exaggeration of gender. This is a good example to see different takes on masculinity. Could we have the next slide, please? Dionysius in this reading is practically depicted as a female, notice the wide hips, also the material, the exquisiteness, also the frothing draperies. This is a, this is a, uh, a form that comes out of uh, Aphrodite rising from the bath, the form of seduction. The genitals are about to be relieved, uh, about to be exposed, rather. Right? Can I have the next slide, please? Sorry about that. <laughs>
steel in what is what it appears to be are two priestesses visiting a goddess in a rustic shrine. There's a great deal of evidence in my known studies which specialize area of antiquity uh, that these are not two priestesses, but the two males dress up as priestesses. It's an interesting theory. I don't know the current status of the theory, but it's something to consider because that makes hard to uh, of course, warriors were very important for Greek and Roman life. Once again, gender role. Next, please. And in Egypt, in the Old Kingdom, there was pretty well the quality of the sexes. As I said, it was a patriarchy, but, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it was uh, the, the male rule, but in order to get the authority for rule, he had to marry the right female. And you see here uh, the parity of the two. Grab the next please. Uh, there is always in every culture what's called the somatical norm, the ideal body. The ideal body for the standard female and the ideal body for the standard male. We have Greek form here for female. Notice the, once again, the emphasis on surface details, on fabric and so forth. This also brings together the idea of class, which I won't mention. Next slide, please. Uh, and of course the male, the ideal male form. Next slide. And of course, elaborate hair. Uh, males were the human resource of the Greek state. And this is quite an important training for the military and so forth. We have the next slide. And of course, hair is always a good classification. This is a sidewalk. Both girls in the warrior nation in Egypt have to use sidewalks uh, to even take care of and so forth. Next slide. Other gender roles in Greek, but of course, the scholar, the philosopher, next. Or, of course, the politicians. I put these guys in, these folks in, because they're very important for gay history. These are the tyrannicides. These are the two lovers that founded the concept of democracy. Let's do the next slide. And, of course, they are so important to Athens that they become the motif on Athena's shield, the basis of the state. Let's do the next slide, please. And uh, Roman art, Gender is marked by hand gestures a great deal. Hand gestures are very important in Roman art. And you can tell a great deal about what the person is, their class, their status, and so forth, uh, by their hands. This woman is saying, I am a just and virtuous woman. Put that next slide. And of course, gender roles in antiquity, uh, as I said, parallel some of those today. Women can be in, in women's quarters. Very often, men and women live separately in antiquity because private life and public life And of course, there was always the PD, professional beauty, both men and female. Next slide. Uh, entertainers were also another opportunity, and of course, next slide. And of course, I had to put staff all in because this is a community center. This is one of our best representations from antiquity of Sappho, and she's there with her friend Alpheus. Uh, and Sappho was the greatest pop singer of her age. This day stays from about two centuries after her death. We have the next. The relations between the sexes are complex. It's very difficult to understand. One of the gender aspects of antiquity were intense same-sex friendships. It's hard to know where intimacy left off and sexuality began. This is really a modern concern. It isn't an ancient concern. Uh, two men on a tombstone bidding each other. The, old, the man bidding the younger man to survive. The relationship is unspecified. Next slide. And of course, the relationship between women, we have even less information about. Uh, this may be a woman and her daughter, it may be a woman and her servant girl. Another tombstone from Athens, next slide, please. And of course, the relations between sexual relations with women, not specifically gender, but I put this in because this is a very important issue that has very little scholarship of it, uh, on it. Uh, this shows purportedly two courtesans preparing themselves for an evening. And we have the one woman kneeling for Cuny, the Cuny here of the other woman. This is a, a terribly intimate and rather delightful little portrait. Uh, it's published by a fellow who is very open minded, another man, and he's quite comfortable with homosexuality. Um, he doesn't see anything erotic in it, and I can't see how he can fail to see anything erotic in it. 
testimony with men is easier to see. This is a warm cup. It's up at the neck. I try to put all cheeks in that we can see. Uh, you, it's high quality. We also know from antiquity that a lot of the painters were female. Sculptors and so forth tend to be more male. Uh, next slide, please. And as I said, it's often very forthright. Uh, offerings at the shrine, a uterus, a breast, a phallus, and a hand. Next slide. And of course, there's on occasion, this is in Boston, a delightful little phallus. If you've ever been 18 and then you know exactly what this is. This is the next slide, please. And of course, equal time antiquity. An erotic scene between opposite couples. Next slide. An erotic scene between same sex couples. Uh, two men on the left. A little more elaborate scene. Uh, next slide. Uh, Dining and parties were all complicated in gender roles that are very different from ours today. Uh, a party, a symposium, a drinking party. Women are seated with men, sometimes they separately, sometimes with men, depends on class, custom, and so forth. Next slide. And of course, an eternal banquet and remuneration in southern Italy with two men. Next slide. Of course, yeah, I'll finish up with the idea of the hero and how did Christ get beard? Let's wrap this up. Uh, the hero is very important in Western art. We see here Achilles, gender markers, heroic structure, a body here. He's dressed. He's dressed in a particular uh, high-powered suit. He has uh, um, he has no beard. The next slide. We have to put the next tray in now. There are about seven slides on that tray. It's right under there. Thank you. 
Christ and wrap this up? Why does Christ have a beard? Now let's go to the marketing. What do you do if you have a new product, a new cult, and you need brand recognition? You need to set it, define it, set it, make it distinct from all the other competitions. Now we have antennas, we know from the early church fathers that the cult of was confused with that of Jesus in Egypt. We have lots, we have Theseus, we have lots of strong male gods who are nude and beardless. We also have, next slide please. We have Christ the Good Shepherd. Once again, no beard. This is getting confusing. Next slide. Uh, and we have, of course, Alexander the Great. The first successful, the first successful public relations, I call it the first successful public relations project in antiquity. Alexander was forging a universal world empire based on certain values, humanistic values. He fearless, he had a certain type of hair, and he knew. So what you do, you add a beard to Christ to make it to make it specific, next slide please, and to have identification of forms. You can't use the same symbols. Uh, you can't use a ram-headed god which has virility, sexuality, and male gender. You have to have, next slide please, the Lamb of Christ who has neither gender nor sex. And what about Mary? I'm certainly not going to be Mary out. Next one please. We have ISIS, so type of ISIS, next slide. Once again, this is not Mary, this is ISIS from Egypt. Next slide, please. And we have Queen of Heaven. We have a sky goddess. Uh, Mary takes the titles of Hathor of Egypt. In the, in the New Testament, uh, the only place, the only goddess that, that Mary runs into in Egypt is the goddess Isis Hathor. And her titles are, of course, Mistress of Heaven, or Queen of Heaven. And she has particular gender roles. She's maternal and she's protective. Next slide, please. This, of course, is very keen that the Roman Catholic, the controversy over whether we go for Mary today, is quite important theologically, and this has to do with gender roles. Creation versus maternal versus protection, and so forth. Next slide, please. So, gender and marketing is very pronounced. We have the New Yorker team around New Yorker with the powerful man, the gentleman with the with the DVD saying, call your mother now. Next slide, please. And so, even the simplest easy gown can be ruined by a penis. <laughs> Things are simply returning to normal. And with that, I think we'll start the panel and get things moving. Okay. Now we have to take the screen down and get the panel moving. I'm sorry for the complications. So after five years of having to be very much of the information, so he described himself as 46, who we were born in Chicago, has been in New York for the last few years. He was a nice illustrator, most of the men's artists have been by Kathy Carr, Tyler's competition, running the AXX class called Hands On, aka Private Orders.
become more inclusive than all of us as individuals benefit, thereby society benefits, because you know we, we can be exactly what we are with fewer constraints that restrict our creativity, right. that restrict our ability to contribute to society, um, and society can only benefit. I just want to add one thing to that, and then we'll go to the uh, go to you for questions. It's interesting thing in anthropology that competitiveness is a quintessentially masculine activity. But also the observation is made that when men dress as women, they are their most competitive. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Questions for the audience? Sure.
different ideal with a different political message. That message fails, and you have a period called the Tetrarch, and the uh, Tetrarchy, and you've got the, the men at St. Mark's, and you've got wonderful examples of this period. Okay. Yeah, are we running out of time? Oh, yeah. Yes. It had to do a philosophy. The beards in the 18th century uh, had to do with the absence of a beard. A beard was considered, this is something that uh, really, I mean, my opinion of it is it has to do with social matters in the 18th century. And beards and I introduced mutton chops starting in the teens and the 20s after the Napoleonic Wars, and they become beards. The idea of a beard as a, uh, as a stalwart male figure comes in in American politics in the 40s and the 50s, and of course, Lincoln is one of the first. I think Lincoln is the first president to have a full beard. Uh, pictures exist of young Lincoln, the lawyer, without a beard. And then, in the 1860s, 1870s, and so forth, the beard was Gary Brewer. Now, the beard disappears, and there's a classifying period, and so forth. That would be an interesting project for someone to do a tractor, a political motif. And you get, interestingly, the iconography of John Kennedy, in my opinion, goes back to another motif, and if you, must, uh, you look at the guy, uh, Stein, who was the candidate here in New York, he had that young, radical motif, too. And in fact, in the famous uh, debate uh, where, uh, what's his name, is called, he wanted Jack Kennedy response. Uh, Benson, I think, um, responds to uh, Dan Quayle. Yeah, correct.
remember from high school in uh, 25 years ago that there was a study down in Ralph Humphreys, and maybe someone in the audience knows that this, or the town knows that it's superseded, but the study stated that most cross-dressers are heterosexual males, and they cross-dress for emotional reasons. And this was uh, a classic study down in the early 70s, and I was an undergraduate.